that is a fear of Dom. And that is Jeff Moody. And you're watching Arise. From London's West End. And this is Showbiz Weekly. On today's show, she's done it again. The world's most powerful women have been revealed, and Taylor Swift sets another record by becoming the youngest person to be included. Who needs James Bond? Bridesmaid star Melissa McCarthy is a woman on a mission, a new film Spy, and it's set to be another laugh out loud hit. And ever since he became the youngest black comedian to perform stand-up at the Hammersmith Apollo, he's been cracking jokes on some of the top comedy circuits in Britain. Nabil Abdul-Rashid joins us later in the show. Now, Forbes has released their list of the world's most 100 most powerful women. German Chancellor Angela Merkel is waving her shoulder pads up there at number one. Hillary Clinton is bringing up the rear, and Britain's Queen, of course, is there too. But when it comes to the world of celebritydom, there are one or two surprises. The 100 most influential women of our time. The usual suspects may be. Certainly no surprises that our Oprah comes in at number 12. She's worth 12 billion bucks, is Oprah. The long-running queen of American daytime TV is a power puss like no other. She's got her own cable network. It screens sitcoms and dramas and makes her a lot of lolly. Her movie company, Harpo Films, co-produced the Martin Luther King biopic Selma, allowing her a little part in the movie too. She's the only African-American on the list. She's raised millions for various causes. She even owns a school for girls in South Africa. She's what's known in the business as an all-round good egg. At number 21, the Queen Bee herself, yes, Beyonce. Ms. Knowles' on-the-run tour with her husband Jay-Z grossed around $100 million, giving the Hollywood couple the same daily rate as the Rolling Stones. She's also pulled in half a billion dollars as a solo artist. Half a billion dollars. That's a lot. So who's next? No surprises, perhaps. It's Ellen DeGeneres, number 50. The talk show host has long been savvy about where and how viewers are watching her shows. She capitalised on the power of YouTube years ago, and more recently developing her own website devoted to video, Ellen Tube. She's got a production company, a Netflix series and a woman's clothing line. And soon a book on interior design, if that's your thing. Now it gets a bit surprising. Next up, Sofia Vergara. She occupies number 57. They reckon she's the highest paid actress on TV, $325,000 an episode for Modern Family. There's also endorsement deals, her talent management company and her marketing firm. She's smart, she's beautiful and she's engaged to be married. And finally, in at number 64, none other than Afia's BFF, Taylor Swift. Some achievement considering she's just 25, the youngest on the list. The singer-songwriter went from country starlet to pop superstar with the launch of her album 1989 last autumn, the top-selling release of the year, with over three and a half million copies sold, making her one of only three artists with a platinum album last year. So, out of the top most powerful women in the world, five are celebs, jostling with the politicians, royals and moguls. Let's see how many make the list next year. Do Pete and Yongo, anyone? Well, there's some beef brewing in the music industry between ASAP Rocky and Rita Ora. The rapper's hit out of the British singer in his new song, Better Things, revealing some rather explicit details of a past fling they had. Speaking about why he called the singer out, he said she got, in, got him into a lot of trouble when he was in a relationship and he did things with her that he wasn't supposed to. Well, Rita Ora hasn't responded to his comments. Jay-Z and Beyonce have created an uproar on social media after posting a photo with the staff of Tidal. Well, after seeing the photo, many noted a lack of diversity among the company's workers. Well, some people pointed out that Tidal was created by a streaming service based in Norway, where 97% of people are white. It didn't stop the critics from lashing out. Meanwhile, Tidal's allegedly run into problems while renegotiating deals with record companies to upload their music. It's been reported it could mean that Beyonce, who's also a co-owner of the service, may have to remove her albums. 
Well, finally, the future's looking brighter for Lindsay Lohan, who's off probation for the first time in eight years. The Mean Girl star has just completed more than 100 hours of community service, which is part of a plea deal for reckless driving. The 28-year-old, who's now living in London, <coughs> tweeted that hard work pays off and that this is a clean slate and a fresh start. Good luck to her. Well, authorities in the US are investigating claims that B.B. King was poisoned. His daughters are alleging the blues legend, who died earlier this month, was poisoned by his business manager and personal assistant. Lawyers for King's estate have said the claims are unfounded and disrespectful, and the two have dismissed the charges. A coroner has confirmed a homicide investigation is underway, and the results could be expected in weeks. Ben Stiller has paid tribute to his mother, the actress and comedian Anna Mira, who has died at the age of 85. Mira, who launched a stand-up career with her husband Jerry Stiller in the 1950s, went on to become a Broadway film and television star. A family statement said her memory would live on in the heart of her family and the millions she entertained as an actress, writer and comedian. And the longtime manager of U2 has died in Los Angeles, where the band is currently on tour. Bono has paid tribute to Dennis Sheehan, describing him as a family member and said the group are still taking it in. He wasn't just a legend in the music business, he said. He was a legend in our band. He's irreplaceable. Well, his death came hours after the band's first concert in their 20-city tour. The 68-year-old died of natural causes. Kira Knightley has become a mum after welcoming a, welcoming a baby with her husband, according to reports. The news comes two years after the Oscar-nominated actress married James Wrighton in a romantic ceremony in France. Although reports confirmed her pregnancy in December, the 30-year-old kept her bump under wraps and only spoke out about the pregnancy early this year. Now, Ed Sheeran seemed very happy with the results of his Madame Tussauds waxwork when it was unveiled in New York this week. The singer couldn't help but take a selfie with his doppelganger, which was carrying a guitar donated by Ed himself. Speaking before the waxwork was revealed, he explained a bit about the creation process. They put you in grey underwear and a grey uh, vest, and you stand there for two hours while strangers poke you. Um, and, yeah, hopefully it comes out looking all right. Can you tell the difference? Well, Comedy Central has announced a premiere date for the new host of The Daily Show. Trevor Noah, who's from South Africa, will take over from Jon Stewart in September. The network announced the premiere via Twitter, along with a video which features Noah trying out his new desk, at least until a disapproving Stewart appears and scares him away. Mm, good luck to him. Now, Prince William has admitted in a TV interview that he'd love his children to be Aston Villa fans, just like him. He said he'd like to take Prince George to a football match, although he did say it's a bit soon and that he'd have to run it past the missus first. He also joked that Princess Charlotte will probably end up being a Villa fan too, while George will support probably someone else. Now it's that time when we take a look at the week in celebrity tweets. Time for a quick break, but when we come back, Afia will be talking us through this week's hot new music releases. Yes, I will. The weekend has surprised fans with a surprise new song and video, which has been lifted from its second official major label release due out later this year. We'll be taking a look and a listen right after this.
banking needs. Guarantee Trust Bank will be there now and into the future. Because you're at the heart of everything we do. Guarantee Trust Bank. Proudly African. Truly international. judge who ruled that pop star Shakira's hit single Loka was an illegal copy of a Dominican songwriter's work now says the songwriter may have lied on the stand. The US district judge said that new evidence presented by two Sony Corp units, the defendants in the case, have caused him to lose trust in the trial testimony. He's ordered the owner of the rights to the song to appear for a seven-day hearing in August. Sony says it's proof a cassette tape at the center of the copyright accusations was fabricated. The Rolling Stones have proved they're as popular as ever, playing out to a sold-out crowd at the start of a 15 cities run across North America. Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, Ronnie Woods and Charlie Watts were in good form in San Diego as they began their new zip code tour. They treated fans to performance of Jumpin' Jacks along with hits from their 50-year back catalogue. The tour is set to finish in Canada in mid-July. Now, it's that time in the show when Afia tells us exactly what we really should have been listening to this week and what we should listen to next week, too. So, uh, Afia, what have you got for us to start with? OK. First of all, we have Man of the Moment, ASAP Rocky, who, when he's not busy beefing with Rita Ora, has made a brand new album called At Long Last, ASAP. We've been waiting for this album for two years. Now, this is one of the singles and videos off the album. This is called LSD. Let's have a look. LSD, I presume we don't mean it's Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. We're talking about a slightly trippier LSD. Yeah, I think so. It's it's a very kind of woozy, disorientating mashup yes, video of whispers and echoes and slow motion bass. And I think I what's really it. quite unusual about this song is that he's not actually rapping on this. He does the kind of rapping, singing thing that Kanye's been doing for a while, that The Weeknd does as well, and Drake. And he's taken from that kind of, that, that unsuspecting soulful falsetto thing and it just sounds brilliant. It's a lovely Beautiful. video. Beautiful and also the really colours on the video as well. Yeah, it's gorgeous and very well yeah, shot. It is. Um, so what about the rest of the album then? Is it, is it typical ASAP? Do we think? It is, it is. I mean it's typical that it has his production on it, it has some old production on it as well. I mean it's really dense, it's stylically, stylistically quite progressive. Stylically. I know, that was a made up <laughs> <laughs> Stylistically, it's good, it's good. quite progressive and more audacious than his first album, I think. And it's a really great example, I think, of where hip hop was going. I mean, we had Drake, who came out with the rather hard, if you're if you're reading this now, it's too late. And then we obviously had To Pimp a Butterfly from Kendrick Lamar, which is more this stylish, conscious story of an album. But this is kind of drifting through ambient soundscapes, and it's just beautiful. So it's a great is, it, album. is it one for everyone, or is it sort of more for hardened fans, do you think? hip-hop fans? I think it's for people who love hip-hop, but everybody should try and give it a listen. Absolutely. Okay. So what have you got next? The Weekend. The Weekend, the weekend. yeah. So Fresh from Mr. Sex from Arnett, which obviously was from Fifty Shades of Grey, your favourite film ever. <laughs> this is his Stop new song. That. Yes, it is. This is his new song, The Hills, so let's have a listen. I only you in its I know I'm a lot older than you and I'm a bit old-fashioned, but it's a bit dark. Couldn't they switch the lights up? 
It is a I can't very see anything. It's a very dark concept for this video. It's quite dark and eerie. So it starts with, with the weekend emerging from this car crash, and then two girls come out of the car after him, and then the vehicle explodes. I've ruined it for everyone. This is all spoilers. And then he kind of walks downward and gets to this house, and then there's two girls upstairs and an old lady. It's all very odd. Okay. <laughs> it's it all very odd. <laughs> it looks a bit odd. Yeah. So okay. So look, you know, he's dropped a few new tracks. Yeah. Are, are, are we then expecting the album? And, and will it be as dark as this? I think so. It's out later on this year, so it's going to be the follow-up to 2030's Kissland. So hopefully, it's sooner rather than later, because we love the weekends. Okay. Yes. Better lighting next time. <laughs> Finally, what have you got for us? Right. So completely opposite from the first two. This is some pure power pop. This is Tori Kelly with Nobody Love. Oh. You're going to love this. Yeah, that's the sort of song that I'll be singing on the train home, and, and you too. Me too, and everyone in the gallery. It's so awesome, it's such an earworm, it just gets right in there. Now, she's so good that Simon Cowell called her almost annoying. He kicked her off the ninth season of American Idol, and she says it was the best thing that ever happened to her. Fantastic. Did you just use the word earworm again? I did, and I, I will... Uh, it's an earworm. I'll use it again. Right. There you go. Lovely. It's an earworm. <laughs> it's an earworm. A fear. Thank you very much. <laughs> Now, the cast and creators of TV comedy The Big Bang Theory have created a $4 million scholarship fund to support low-income science students. The fund will sponsor, sponsor studies in science, technology, engineering and maths at the University of California, Los Angeles. Series star Mayim Balik earned a PhD in neuroscience from the university back in 2007. The first 20 scholars will be announced on The Big Bang Theory set this autumn. I don't think that there's any argument that you're, you're the pivotal reason for our success. You have been, you have clearly, you know, accomplished something that is beyond anyone's imagination with all the awards and the great theater work. And, uh, and I know that uh, this is just the beginning. Hollywood action star Dwayne The Rock Johnson has certainly proven that he knows how to make an entrance. The actor arrived for the premiere of his latest film on the back of a fire truck, which was followed overhead by a rescue helicopter, as you do. San Andreas is a heart-pounding disaster movie about a chopper pilot heading out to rescue his daughter and ex-wife following a devastating earthquake in California. The 43-year-old actor, who's fast becoming one of Hollywood's most bankable stars, said making the film pushed him to his limit. It was incredibly taxing because there was just so many elements that we had worked on in the movie just in terms because you have all the elements of you have all the elements and 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 impact of the largest earthquake of all time. So yeah, it was it was a taxing <laughs> it was a taxing movie. But you know, you gotta get up and you gotta do your thing and you gotta work hard, you gotta grind it out. Exactly. Well, it's not every day you get a handsome hunk on each arm, unless you're Melissa McCarthy, of course. This week, the Bridesmaid star turned up to the London premiere of her new movie with Jude Law on her one side and Jason Statham on the other. A fear. I really wish she'd have been there somewhere too. Melissa McCarthy has proved she can be a new type of action hero in our latest film, Spy. She walked the red carpet at the European premiere of the movie in London's Leicester Square. It was great. I have a lot of bruises. I pulled an incredible amount of muscles. But uh, weirdly, I loved it. Like, I would sign up for another one in a minute. I loved all the action. I love kind of the challenge of, of how hard it is hard to do. It's, it's a lot to not get yourself hurt, not hurt the other person, but I just loved it. Without being detected. But In the film, McCarthy plays Susan Cooper, a CIA analyst who nominates herself to go undercover to expose an arms dealer. She gets into all manner of comedic scrapes in the process, with the actress at the center of a number of elaborate stunts and car chases. 
But despite her character's belief that the life of a spy is a glamorous one, her intelligent service bosses always ask her to go undercover dressed as dowdy older women who love cats. I picked out those wigs and when I talked to someone who actually did that job undercover in the CIA, she said that you know what the outfits they get were always very, very dull. She was you were not supposed to stand out. She goes, I don't know about the cat shirt, she goes, but looking kind of like a frumpy like a frumpy tourist who is not far off. I was like, oh, look at that. I'd say you Her co stars, including Jude Law, were full of praise for her performance. It was great. I mean it was it's it's tricky, it's a science, it's a process. Um, I didn't feel as I, I've improvised and, and, and worked off script several times before, but mining for kind of comedy lines or laughs is, is very different. And watching people like Rose and uh, Miranda and, and obviously Melissa, who are masters at it, was uh, a learning curve and sometimes slightly uh, overwhelming. This is as brave as I ever get to try and do something different. Uh, you know, and uh, the wheels come off and you, you get to do something great with Melissa. And she's probably the funniest thing there is in, uh, in cinema today. She also talked about her forthcoming role in the all-female reboot classic of 1980s comedy Ghostbusters, alongside Kirsten Wigg and Kate McKinnon. We start in about four weeks, we start Ghostbusters. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. And that's with such a group, a great group of ladies that I'm really excited about it. I just hear my mom's voice. Just blend in, let somebody else win. Maybe Spy is released you know, in UK funny. cinemas on June the 5th. Susan, just to write that in my lunchbox. Now, he was just 22 when he became the youngest black comedian to perform stand-up at the Hammersmith Apollo in London. And since then, Nabil Abdul-Rashid has gone on to crack jokes in some of the top comedy circuits in Britain. And there's no denying he's a funny man. His comedy show, Don't Panic, I'm Islamic, is still being chuckled at. And he was the joint winner of the Which Religion is Funniest competition. He's currently performing a Black Lives Matter, bringing together the finest in black British talent at the world-famous Comedy Store in London. Well, before we speak to Nabil Abdul-Rashid, let's have a look at his own brand of delicious and slightly risque humour. Recently, I was reading a newspaper, right, and it had this article going, very soon, ethnic minorities will outnumber indigenous white people in Britain. Rawr! And I was like, the editor of this, this newspaper has definitely been to Peckham, you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> I don't like news like that because it's divisive, it makes us really edgy, and we don't appreciate other cultures. And also, it makes us think that there's only two types of people in England, white and other. What about gingers? <laughs> they should be included. I love the ginger people and I love their cause because, I mean, recently they tried to become independent and they failed. Uh, <laughs> You know, that's what counts. Gin you know that ginger people have been persecuted for years. They were the only people that weren't allowed to compete under their own nationality during the Olympics because they had the one guy that would have beaten Usain Bolt. Because run as fast as you can, you can't beat the gingerbread man. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Nouveau, thanks for joining us in the studio. So let's start with Black Lives Matter. It's a, a fundraiser for the Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust. So tell us how you got involved with that. Uh, well, a friend of mine, uh, Imran, you know, we, we, we've got a little WhatsApp group of all the uh, brown and permanently tanned comedians, as we like to call ourselves. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we were thinking because, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in America right now. And as you know, whether we like it or not, we are attached to them. Um, so, you know, we were thinking, what could we do? Because there is a problem here mm -hmm. um, in the UK uh, when it comes to police brutality and also, you know, black on black violence too, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, Imran came up with the idea initially. Um, we've, we'd already done a charitable uh, gig uh, two months earlier at the comedy store called uh, Hello, Ha, LOL, a play on the Muslim word Halal. Uh, we're actually doing that again soon. Um, and he thought, you know, it would be nice if we all got together and did something um, to help the charitable trust. So, uh, yeah, kind of Imran brought the idea. We agreed with him. The ball's rolling now, so. Nice. So, Don't Panic, I'm Islamic. It yeah. has to be the best title for a show ever. How did the show come about? Um, again, you know, um, as, as, uh, I'm a stand-up comic, uh, and um, I'm labelled as a Muslim stand-up comic. And uh, a lot of the time, I've, I've done shows, and people have come up to me, um, you know, obviously at different stages of drunkenness, and like, I didn't know <laughs> that Muslims could do comedy, and I thought laughing was not Islamic. And, you know, I just thought, that, that's terrible, that people have this um, idea about Muslims that we're not jokey people, that we're not happy, jovial people. Mm -hmm. So um, I thought, you know, I, I, should, I should do a title, I should, I should do a show and make it clear from the title that, yes, I am Muslim, 
unapologetically Muslim, um, but I'm still human. I'm not going to harm you. So my, my comment is about humanizing Muslims and offending white people. <laughs> But, I mean, you, they say you should never joke about religion or politics. I mean, you, you, you definitely joke about religion. I mean, the, these are people's faith. Um, do you ever offend people? Um, yeah, but um, in my mind, I came to the conclusion that um, it's okay to offend those people because they're stupid. No, I'm just, <laughs> no you know what it is? Actually, um, with, with my comedy, um, I try, I, I never try to offend people just for the sake of offending people. Um, there's always a moral point behind what I'm trying to say. Um, you know, it's, it's like, you know, with the shows that I do or, or the jokes that I write, there's always a reason. So, for example, Black Lives Matter, which is the 8th of June, um, we, we, we're doing that for a reason. We're trying to raise money. Um, with the jokes I tell, I might be trying to prove a point. It might be about Islamophobia or racism. But sometimes to prove that point, you have to kind of dance on the line a bit. So how important is it to your comedy that you're a British Nigerian? I mean, could Jeff tell your jokes, for example? <laughs> Jeff can't tell. I have really bad comic timing. Well, if, he had a, if he had a bodyguard, you could. Uh, no. <laughs> you know what? I think for me, my jokes are personal because they're from my life experiences um, and, and very much my opinions. Now, a lot of people uh, by proxy might share these opinions and um, experiences. But um, I, I, I think, you know, you'd, you'd have a tough time doing my act. But certainly the topics I cover could be done by anyone. Mm. I mean, you, you obviously view comedy as a, as a very powerful tool. Um, a tool for what? what? What do you try and achieve by this brand of I'm a very shy person. I'm a very quick-tempered person too. Uh, oh, but she's like that. Yeah, she's it's, like uh, that. it's that, it's that <laughs> fiery West African blood no, we've got. But um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's good because like I've used it, for example, outside of outside the stage, uh, the comedy club setting. I've used it to do workshops with youth. Um, different, you know, some are with uh, youth with behavioral problems. Um, some might be from underprivileged homes, have learning difficulties, and I've used that. You know, it, it's it's a very powerful thing. I just thank them for being there. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> there Come on with a suit like that, yeah. Mm. Is there anything that's just too risque for you that you just wouldn't joke about? Uh, no. Um, I, I think as long as I, my thing is, I've got my morals and my beliefs. I. I stick to, and like you mentioned, people's faiths and stuff. Um, I wouldn't insult anyone's religion, but I would talk about the people within the religion, if that makes sense, because they're not perfect. Everybody thinks their religion is perfect, right? But no one thinks that all practitioners of a religion are perfect. So I could do a joke about Muslims or Christians or, or Jewish people, but I would never do a joke about Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. Mm. Mm. Okay, so tell us when Black Lives Matter is on. Oh, sorry, I've already done the plug. Okay, I'll do the plug in. It's yeah, the 8th of June. Okay. Um, it's not Thank far you. from where we are now, which I will not divulge. Um, but um, uh, it's uh, the London Comedy Store on Oxford Street. Um, it's featuring myself, Nathan Caton, Marlon Davis, Prince Abdi, and Jason Patterson. Uh, it's going to be a nice, wholesome family. It's going to be family friendly as well, so you can uh, bring people down. White people are more than welcome. You just have to pay more. And, uh, <laughs> you know, but it's Fantastic. all for a good cause. Nabil, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank Love you for having me. Thank you. Well, we're out of time now. That's it for today. We'll be back same time next week. From us and all the team, thank you for watching. Bye-bye. Thinking of banking in Africa? Then think Zenith, one of the biggest in Nigeria, with assets over $16 billion. Listed among the 20 most influential brands in the world and winner of Best Bank in Corporate Governance. The most customer-focused bank in Nigeria. A success built on three foundations, dedicated to people, technology, service. Zenith Bank, in your best interest.